So thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to talk about my passion. Um, I have a few affiliations. I, my company's policy um, states I must tell you today I'm only speaking on behalf of DNA Biotech, no other entity. I'm going to convince you I had an academic career at one point. I now have a business career. I'm going to talk about researchers and entrepreneurs, what in, is innovation, who I think drives it, you may not agree, what I think we need going forward in terms of national system of innovation, uh, what we need for innovation to succeed in South Africa, two major threats, there may be more, that I see staring us in the face in terms of innovation at the national level, now, I don't have a crystal ball. They didn't hand it out in my science school, but I do know four things for sure about the future. I'll share that with you. I'm also going to tell you what an innovative engineer looks like. And then I'm going to try to urge you to find your role in, in innovation and then to be the change. So I have three, these three men to thank for my academic career. But I wanted to say, after the previous two speakers, I did not change my slides. <laughs> so, so just be aware of that as I uh, touch on similar topics that they've touched on. I'm most grateful to the people who taught me the difference between pseudoscience and science. Um, I started as a student, of course. I ended up as head of department graduated students, and even in the private sector, I've had two extraordinary appointments, which I'm very grateful for. My business career, uh, the success of DNA Biotech, I attribute that to, to the, all the past and present members of my team. They have literally helped me to drag DNA Biotech from concept to profit. And the one man who taught me how to lead a business team, a uh, small disclaimer, I'm married to this <laughs> other director. <laughs> Uh, of DNA Biotech, yeah, I fought it for many, many times, didn't want to go into business with my husband, kept on saying, yeah, if I, I want something, somebody like you, like you, and eventually got over myself. He taught me almost everything I know about business, but the most important thing was, he's a global entrepreneur, has a global company, he's a serial entrepreneur, so he was a very good example for me as to what an entrepreneur should be. I always say I became IP aware via osmosis in my house. <laughs> um, <laughs> my business career, my company is in biotech. We have these three portfolios. In the beginning, we did research, um, hardcore research, human uh, genetics field, et cetera, et cetera. Um, our, research, our, our business models have changed over time a little bit. Uh, we do do the training that Jan C. mentioned, and I'm also mentioning it again. Let me start off by saying patents are extremely effective and very good tools. I'm standing in front of you as an entrepreneur with 18 years' experience. So I've, I think I've figured out how to make money. I think I've figured out how to run a sustainable company. I own zero patents. I have run a business, made a business from something that you all, if you're sitting in this room, you already have it. You already have it. I'll talk about it more <laughs> later. Um, I discovered when I left academia that I knew how to do certain things. I discovered other people, yeah, you have to look for them. I now call them the market. They're willing to pay very good money to be able to do it, so I had tons of know-how. This is our client profile, you already heard that. These are some of our South African clients, some of our academic clients, our public clients, our private clients. You can see I'm skipping through these sectors. And this is what we do. If people ask me, um, what's my business? I usually, off the cuff, would say translation. And what I mean is, our company translates intellectual capital to market capital. So, what is a researcher and an entrepreneur? We have to recognize that these two individuals or two groups of people have different takes on the world. Here it says, um, I just wrote the most beautiful code of my life. I, I, they casually handed me an impossible a problem, and in 48 hours and 200 lines, don't worry, you'll also need glasses at some point, I solved it. In academia, I used to say, 
great. This will mean we'll have half a dozen papers, a thesis or two, and a paragraph in every textbook of queuing theory from now on. In my, my field, it was human genetics. Now, in the private sector, I say, you got the problem, to, um, the program to stop germing up? Great. Now, while you're fixing stuff, can you also sync our outlook with our phones? <laughs> Different mindsets. So, are these roles mutually exclusive, is my question. Can you be only one? People told me when I started my company, scientists are very bad managers, you should never run your own company. Um, fortunately, I'm rather hard-headed, so I follow my own thoughts. Um, but I did ask myself, since I started as a researcher, should I retire as a researcher? At one point, I was absolutely ready to do that, because I like the research endeavor. The traditional roles was usually to focus on research, publish papers, and believed academia drives innovation. That was me more than two, two, two decades ago. So it's all about the research and the knowledge it creates. Now, entrepreneurs used to solely focus on the business, make profit. By the way, making money is a noble endeavor. Um, I have found in my career that if you don't have money, you can't help anybody. So if you want to argue that with me, I'd love to invite you for a coffee in my office. I'm just across the road. And believe the private sector alone drives innovation. This created this us and them mentality when I entered the innovation space. Um, and this innovation chasm, there was research and there was industry, but these two sectors didn't talk to each other. At the national level, it stifled innovation, and there were multiple missed opportunities. Each sector believed they, only they see the truth. One sector was saying it's definitely an orange. Another sector was saying it's definitely a kiwi fruit. But when you actually look at it from both <laughs> perspectives, it's neither. It's something with much more value. And I make this analogy to innovation. You have to look at the entire innovation network. Who does what? We have to clarify these roles. Prof. Jonathan Janssen, who is the president of ASAF, said when I was inaugurated as a member the other day, said words matter. And I, I absolutely agree with him. Then we can decide once we know what it is and what our roles are, who drives it. And even is this the right question to ask? So what is innovation? Um, the two directors of the Innobiotics sat down. We try to define innovation as the smallest number of steps, aspects, activities. Literally define it, what it means to us in the Innobiotic. We tested this model with many other small biotechs, also with very large internationals. They all agreed this is how they innovate. They start with a concept, traditionally. Then you do research, development, productization, I'll come back to this, manufacturing and commercialization. This was traditionally the role of researchers and of entrepreneurs. Productization, I want to define it as, let's say I make blue ink. Now, none of you are going to buy a pot of blue ink from me anymore, unless you have a feather somewhere that you can write with. Most of you, however, will buy a good blue pen from me. So now I have to take the blue ink and package it into a product. I have to productize my blue ink before the market will take it up as a product. All right, so then we realized that it's not a unidirectional flow of information in this innovation network. It's actually bidirectional. Oh, it's a little bit more complex because every node in this network is connected to every other node. When we commercialize, we feed information back to all the other nodes. And research is rather complex. Can, I, can you put your hand up if you're a researcher? Okay, you agree, right? It's not just the one node. Well, this is what I discovered. Generating concepts are equally complex. So is development, productization, manufacturing, and commercialization. Hmm, so all of a sudden, it doesn't look so organized anymore. And on top of that, there's only one way to innovate, and that is ethically, if you want it to be sustainable. There's a legal framework you have to take into mind. 
policy framework and many other factors impact on it. I'm not going to go through the whole slide, but this is each of the elements, the input, the process, and the output. Yes, you can see the other director taught me the engineering way of thinking. Um, the idea is background papers and patents. How many of you know or oh, guess a percentage of science literature that's only written down in patents and not in papers? Quickly from the floor, guess a percentage. Can't hear you. 1%? 10%? Now, my colleagues, if you're not reading patents, you're missing 75% of the scientific knowledge in the world. And if you are shocked, I hope the message sinks in. So then you evaluate the idea, you end up with a mature idea, it goes into research, valid research results form fall out if you follow the scientific process correctly. Development, there's a valid research result. Proof of concept, productization leads to prototype. Now I have one, now I'm going to make many in a full in a pilot scale and full scale, and now the, the products are ready for sale. And now I can push them into the market with business processes. So it turns out that if you document your learning curve, other people can also find it useful. And so then Department of Science and Technology were happy to incorporate our small little model into the bioeconomy strategy because it, make, it fit the, the way of thinking, what we need nationally. Um, we also have three short course portfolios, more about that later. The value of know-how, I already mentioned that, but we'll talk about it more later. In our, in our company, these buzzwords like knowledge economy, I keep on asking myself, what does it really mean for us, such a small company? Do we, need, we really need to pay attention to it? And this is what we do. We then unpack what it means. Um, and suffice to say that inventions cost money and innovations make money. Um, innov innovation remain fragmented. And I'm missing a slide. Yeah, I really am. Um, I, had the bio, I had the economy, knowledge economy from knowledge to economy un un uh, packed out here. So innovation remained fragmented. Both sectors were working very, very hard, both researchers and entrepreneurs in the country. But we were, but we were not working necessarily together with the innovation mindset. So clearly each sector on its own cannot fix the innovation fragmentation at the, at the national level. So this silo mentality that we all had, and I'm now blaming in my generation, is no longer relevant and it's not an innovation enabler. The new par paradigm is needed. There's no us and them, I discovered. There's only us. We have to make this work. Our fights are linked in South Africa. And I'm going to quickly try to convince you. I'm in the private sector. I make profit. I pay it to SARS. SARS pays it to Treasury. Treasury allocates it to DSI. DSI allocates it to the NRF. The NRF funds your research and you generate technology that the private sector again can license from you. Our fates are linked. If the private sector crashes, you can't research. And if you crash, the research uh, academic sector crashes, we're all in big trouble. So our fates are linked, then logic dictates in my mind that working together to achieve our common goal of a strong national economy is what we have to do. Each of us have tried on our own, each of these researchers and entrepreneurs um, have tried, we failed to make innovation work because innovation needs both of us to drive it. Each in their own sector, we need this innovation mindset with a high level of engagement um, with the other sector. So, we need a new mindset, and this is what I think we need. Innovation that grows the economy. We require entrepreneurial researchers, and I'll define that in a moment, and researcher entrepreneurs, I'll also define that. So, the entrepreneurial researcher. 
traditionally focused only on research. Now, I have to cultivate the entrepreneurial mindset. In other words, I have to look for unusual, unconventional opportunities, funding outside of the borders of the country. You've heard all the funding woes that everybody mentions. My research must feed into innovation, applied research, therefore. And then my question is, what do we need to fund at the national level? We have to be aware of our roles in innovation and be able to communicate with both the government and the private sector, because our fates are linked. The researcher entrepreneur, in turn, cannot only focus on commercialization. I need to cultivate a research mindset. For me, since I am a scientist, it comes naturally. But we have to cultivate this and keep on cultivating it. We must base our business decisions on scientific fact. It speaks to the sustainability of a company. The business products and services flow from inventions, business with a scientific method approach. I must be aware of my role in, in the innovation network and be able to, com to communicate to other sectors, my colleagues in academia, in the public sector. So, DNA Biotech has know-how, for instance, research and specific technologies. We generated um, income from our intellectual property because we actually documented our know-how in these three portfolios. So we have wet lab short courses that we present, remember my block of academic clients. All but one university. Uh, rest assured, the, um, Mr. Langa, um, Mr. Langa, biostatistics is next. We're rolling it out next year. The business portfolio, but it's actually the business of science. Those things that nobody taught me even up till my PhD level, yet when I walked across that stage, they expected me to know it. That was an eye-opener for me. How to manage my business as a researcher, your desk, your office. IP management with the new IPR Act. It's not new anymore. How to manage a science project. How to write effectively. My small company has had an NIH grant. So if you work in the bio field, you'll understand it's the grant that is mm, at the top most difficult to attain. Um, ethics in science, social responsibility, and these are just grey because they need updating. And in the forensic sector, we're training thousands of attorneys and advocates on how to deal with DNA evidence in court. And we're training other forensic labs how to add statistics to their way of doing business. So we've trained in groups of 150 down to groups of the size of five. This was the first uh, NRF winter school that, that we had in George for three weeks. For NIPMA, we've also trained uh, IP management because as entrepreneurs, we know how to manage IP, not how to write the patents. That's a patent attorney's job. But how do, how do you manage the IP so that the patent can actually flow from it? And then as an entrepreneur, I tell you, it's the only truth that's, that's valuable to me is the brutal truth. You have to see the world as it is, not as I wish it to be, which is maybe like this if I'm in Russia or the US, but this is actually the physical size of those countries. This is real size. So look at that difference. The world looks a little bit different than what people just very off the cuff refer to. Russia, for sure, punching above its weight, Greenland, um, the US, I understand why they don't want to change the Mercator projection view. Um, but look at us in Africa. Now, if you haven't seen this before, the, this, Africa is the size of 14 other countries fit into our area. As an entrepreneur, I'm just seeing it's like light bulbs going off in my head, opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. 
If you can't see the opportunities in that, come for a coffee at my office. <laughs> Perception versus the fact. Oh, whoa, I couldn't believe it when I read in the Sunday Times. It says R&D to the revive the South African economy. R&D cannot do it. The only thing that can do it is innovation. R&D is only a part of it. So no wonder we have this innovation chasm. No wonder we didn't see the products in the market. Because our country has been funding R&D, but not the rest of the network, for a very long time. So the researcher, entrepreneur, OK, <laughs> a little bit information. I'm, uh, Yancy already mentioned, I'm still main, um, supervising one PhD student. I'm not as prolific, or maybe this was just a good year, I don't know. I have, so far this year, I haven't heard about the last one, but I have seven papers out. I'm in the public sector, uh, I'm in the private sector. Publications is not my mm, focus. But what you do when you're a researcher entrepreneur, they can also be written up. Okay, the two, two major threats I want to talk about that I see for innovation, not using all of our national resources and not educating for the future. I will flick through this rather quickly. We do so at great risk for the NSI and the country if we don't use all our resources. This is youth unemployment. Total unemployment, unemployment, discouraged and inactive. Yes, it helps if you have more than metric, but you've seen the numbers of all the unemployed. This is total unemployed, less than matric, matric, and if you have more than matric. Even graduates are now standing at the side of the road saying, please hire me, I have a degree, CV in hand, and this is my, my cell number. This is happening on my watch. This is happening on your watch, if you are my generation. The youth is also not silent on the effect that unemployment has on them. Depression is caused by unemployment. So I'm saying, have we allowed it to go so far that unemployment is now a mental health issue? I argue, absolutely. So, that was the first threat. The second one is not educating for the future, entrepreneurship. Um, yeah, I learned it by osmosis. Financial education. I meet young people every day who are drowned in debt. I don't see them getting out of that debt spiral. And it's not educational debt, it's personal debt. Cars, flashy clothes, etc. Because nobody had educated them about the devastating effect of interest and compounded interest. In my science career, I expected to face the science every day, but never to have to worry about soft skills, assist government and committees. I thought that was for other people. Come to grips with the complexity of ethical frameworks, read laws. I didn't thought I would have to do that as a scientist, but you must. So you may not like it, but if you have a degree in biotech or genetics like I have, you might also have to adapt to the digital world. Yes, learn to code. I also have to... Admit, I cannot code. Python scares me a little bit. The one course I did, <laughs> you know, was interesting. But for sure, you have to become an expert in another field. One field. Being the expert in one field is not going to crack it anymore. The president said he would like to see entrepreneurship taught in schools to develop a culture of self-employment from an early age. There's no alternative. I've long said that entrepreneurial skills should be included in the basic education curriculum. So at least the president and I agree. He said gainful employment, um, so-called comfort of gainful employment, to the perceived insecurity that comes with self-employment. I have more security in my private company than I ever had in academia with respect to every university um, in the country. The president also made these statements. He said, changing the direction of education, relevant skills for the fourth IR, I will call it for now that. <laughs> Second education's crucial role, getting the basics right early. This is critical. How do you teach a child to think critically if you never have taught them how to think? You've just told them what to think. 
this is from the US, but they have, this is actually a cartoon, they've plotted um, grad student enrollment with unemployment. And it seems like the grad students go to grad school because they are unemployed. This is the reality of our country currently. It's dangerous. Um, the, e the education system ultimately must produce graduates that are market ready, that I can employ. How can it be in 2019 that there's no digital portal where a student can click a button and see which jobs are available? I'm horrified to think that my country talks about the fourth IR and this portal doesn't exist. We should just march until it exists. Okay, never let it be said that private sector is now sweeping up everybody. But for me, this is a no-brainer. I wrote the plan for this. It's called the Biotech Info Hub, right? Because products and services and all of that should also be that easy. I couldn't get any funding for it in this country. I could get a U.S. venture capital guy to fund it for an obscene amount of money. Uh, the reason I said no was only because I don't think the U.S. should be sitting, uh, a VC should be sitting with this type of data. I think it should belong to DST, which is why I donated this plan together with my collaborator who wrote it. Um, we, it and all associated IP, we donated to DST because we wanted to get quality validated data and biotech and this jobs portal. Please don't ask me how far they are with implementing it. So for innovation to succeed, the skill, skills that are required by both the entrepreneurial researcher and the researcher entrepreneur are no different. This has already been said. Complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, people management, coordinating, emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence, please don't send me an email. And in your email, you have a link to your LinkedIn profile, and then you have nine mistakes on your LinkedIn profile. This is not a diligent scientist. Please, give me a break. I, for one, am not going to employ you. Super-structured organizations, computational world, extreme longevity, rise of smart machines and systems, new media ecology, and the globally connected world. All of these are opportunities that I can see. This one, I know it's washed out. It says, create your own ladder. St graduates should stop asking, who will employ me? Your question should be, how can I employ myself and perhaps create jobs for a few other STEM graduates? So, we have to educate the pub public on innovation. There are many citizens innovators that have no education. We have to think about non-traditional careers, even science careers have published quite a few. A puzzle on the same campus. My husband is an engineer. When he graduated, he was ready to work for himself. I did a PhD. Okay, he has a master's degree, but I have a PhD. I wasn't ready to work for myself. We graduated from the same campus. What the heck happens in engineering school that doesn't happen in science school? And how difficult can this problem be to solve? I'm just asking. So these two major threats, I think, that are existential, potential to derail the innovation system at the national level, and we ignore them at our peril. So what does an innovative engineer look like? No, I'm not going to show you a picture of my husband. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk about a guy called uh, Mr. Zhang. He invented flatback skyscrapers in China. This is what they look like. They built three floors of very tall high rises in a day, three stories a day, the new, new norm in China. They, 200 workers, erected a 30 story prefabricated hotel in 15 days. This is Mr. Zhang. This is his real office. He does not own a computer, he says he doesn't need it. He literally works with pen and paper literally, and you can see <laughs> what the other tool is that he favors, the magnifying glass. 
Okay, I'm just saying, this is Chairman Zhang. This is his background. He's currently almost 60. He has a degree in fine arts. Would you have ever predicted that he would become one of the leading innovative engineers globally? I would certainly have not. <laughs> he attributes his success to his creativity and his outsider perspective on technology. He worked as a teacher, a librarian, also an interior designer. He fabricated aircon systems that's green and so on. So find your role in innovation and drive it wherever you are. So who drives innovation? It's entrepreneurial researchers and researcher entrepreneurs. What drives innovation is a topic for a whole nother week. But how to create a sustainable innovation system? That is critical to the discussion and the only answer can be we have to create an innovation culture from primary school, secondary, up to university, postgrad, supervisors. I don't care if you're the president of this country, you should be part of this innovation culture. So, no, I already told you I'm not clairvoyant. So nobody knows what lies ahead. These are the type of pictures I don't have the right to on the video, just for the video's sake, to circulate. I'll, I'll, I will send you the list. I have the license to project, but not to circulate. So nobody knows what lies ahead. But these four things I know for sure. I'll stake my name on it. The future is digital, so in my genomics field, it's computational. It's AI and machine learning, because this has been around, as you've heard, for a long time. Robotics, 5G and beyond. So in my own field, I used this slide at the Science Forum last year, and somebody came to me and said, this is never going to happen. I spoke to the person the other day, and they now finally agree. But we all have to process what are the implications for your field? What is the implications for your field if this is part of the future? And then I'm closing off. Once you have found your, your niche in innovation, please, my passion, I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with you, pass it on to the next generation. They are the innovators of the future. Make them passionate about science. This is a program we have in our company where we invite school learners in and we get them to extract DNA and experience the wonders of science. So make them passionate about science. Show them what science is about. Stimulate their curiosity. So what, wherever your position in science in, on the innovation network may be, please drive innovation from your point of application, I want to say, in the innovation network. In DNA Biotech, we found ours in DNA and the many opportunities that it unlocked for us. We didn't forget to stop along the way and smell a rose or two. We also appreciated the path. And our path was unconventional. And I'm saying if you cannot find your unconventional path, how about creating your own? <laughs> Thank you.